why don't we uh, we'll start with a round of introductions. Um, so uh, welcome everybody to the the FOSDEM Dojo, um, which is not happening in Brussels for reasons. Uh, I'm Sean McCants. I'm the CentOS Community Manager. I'm the I'm the new Rich. Uh, so I guess we'll just go around. We've got um, let's see. Amy's here. Davida's here. Mike's here. Pat's here. Um, and Celeste is here. So why don't um, how about we just go around and you can introduce yourselves and then we'll just open it up for people to ask you anything. Um, Amy, you want to start? Sure. My name is Amy Marish. I'm one of the new members of the CentOS board. I come from the cloud sick where I'm part of OpenStack and RDO. I also serve on the Open, Open Infrastructure Foundation Board of Directors. Um, so I bring a lot of governance in and I'm a long time CentOS user and Red Hat user before it was RHEL. Uh, um, oh, uh, Neil is on now. Neil, you want to uh, give a quick introduction to yourself? If he's not ready for that yet, Carl. Well, Davide. Sure. Hi, I'm Davide. I'm a production engineer at Facebook on the Linux team. Uh, I've been involved with the Sandus community for what, five years and change now maybe more. Um, I've been on the board for about a year. Uh, I also chair the Hyperscale SIG, and I pester various Santos people about various things all the time. Uh, okay, I'm trying to, I'm sorry, I keep trying to watch alphabetically and the, um, the list keeps changing on me. Um, Mike, you want to give an introduction? Or, uh, let's see, Pat? Yeah, yeah I do. Uh, I'm Pat Rehecki. I've been on the CentOS board for a couple years now. Uh, my day job is at uh, Fermi National Accelerator Lab, but as always, I don't represent Fermilab in any official capacity. And they'd like me to remind everyone of that because it's important that the communication channels stay official. Uh, I work on various community projects to try and just make some workflows cleaner and more elegant. I've been in open source for 20, 22 years. And uh, yeah, I like free software. And uh, Celeste. Hi, my name is Celeste Lynn Paul, and I am a new CentOS board member. Um, I've been involved in open source for a long time, mostly in the KDE and Kubuntu communities where I focused on uh, usability and human computer interaction. Uh, my day job is at the MITRE Corporation, which is a federally funded research and development center that aims at supporting the government and making the world a better place. We do a lo lot of open source software, standards work, and just general public research. Great. If there's any board members who haven't introdu introduced themselves yet um, that can get on, uh, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, uh, if people want to ask questions, you can use the Q&A tab or just ask in the chat. Um, and if uh, I'll, I'll actually, I'll try to report, repeat the questions uh, if we see them coming up here. If my audio doesn't cut out, they seem to be having audio problems. Be very 
a short session. I'll ask uh, right. Amy and Celeste. Go ahead. I was numbers. just going to start something. <laughs> I was just going to ask, what are, your, what are your plans? What do you want to do now that you're on the board? Sorry, uh, you were breaking up a little bit. I didn't quite hear the question. Yeah, he was breaking up, but I, I got the gist of it. What what do I want to do on the board? So um, what things I would like to do is add a little more openness to the board, um, adding governance, you know, just so that where I come from in my open source background, everything is very in the open. And CentOS has had you know, private board meetings, which have now gone public, and we continue to put things out in the public, which I think is a great thing. Um, so making sure that, you know, even if we don't go to an open elections per se with the CentOS board, having terms so that you never run into the situation where everyone's leaving at once. So if we stagger like Celeste and I are the spring group and so on and so forth, then, you know, next spring, do you want to remain on the board? Or do we know we're going to have an election? Things like that, um, which I think is important for the long-term health of a project. Just know that, you know, you're not going to turn around one day and all your leadership is gone. I think that's really important. Um, one other thing is we put out these um, code of conduct and that was brought in. So now we need to work on how that is going to work because we do have the same auth system with Fedora. So we need to work really closely with this Fedora community to make sure that decisions are for both communities. Because if someone gets banned in Fedora, they get banned in CentOS as well and vice versa. So opening up those types of communication alleys, I think is very important. And to echo what Amy said, um, one of the, this is kind of an interesting transition period for CentOS. So you have, you know, the Fedora community of the CentOS community, but then you also have this new stream relationship with RHEL. And so what does that look like for contributors who contribute to Fedora and CentOS because of, uh, some of the more pure, you know, FOSS or open source um, perspectives that they may have versus supporting a free but commercial distribution such as RHEL. And so managing expectations across the community as we kind of transition some of that um, administration, I think will be really critical. It reminds me a lot of the growing pains that um, Ubuntu had with Canonical kind of standing up some of its more um, commercial service offerings. And there were, you know, fractures in the community for why they were contributing to projects and um, in different ways that we could manage them. But historically, I am an HCI person, a human computer interaction person, and I see open source as a great place to rapidly integrate new and uh, useful usability tips and tricks in order to improve the user experience. And also it's just a, you know, a great platform to test out new usable security and usable accessibility methods um, for software, because I think that's one of the best features of the open source community is being able to rapidly get new ideas out to our users. Yeah, and to expand on that, I think something that is really important is lowering as much as possible the barrier to contribution to the project. Uh, I think we've made massive strides there with the switch to stream, because in the past it was basically impossible to contribute to CentOS. And now we are seeing a thriving community building around stream. And I think our job now is making sure that this community continues to thrive and that whenever things come up that are making life harder for the people that want to do work in the project, that we can help them remove roadblocks and set up connections so they can make progress quickly. Mike, you made it. I did. I was tr I, I default to Firefox at all times, so it, it never occurs to me to use Chromium. 
but yeah, this does not work with Firefox. <laughs> it, it does not, and that's that's disappointing. But <laughs> Mike, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? As you missed that part. Hi, I'm uh, Mike McLean. I'm uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, original board members, and um, uh, I'm. Uh, former release engineer at Red Hat, done a lot of things at Red Hat, uh, and uh, I work mostly on the build system. So if people have used Koji, that's um, a lot of what I work on in my day job. So, hi. Oh, hang on. We have a Q&A from Rich. What does work closely with the Fedora community mean for you? So I gave the COC as an example of someplace where we need to work closely. But David also mentioned, and I think Celeste also as well, onboarding new members. So code might start at Fedora, but we're going to use it as well. So if during the process of code coming to us, we need to backport something or they, they realize something doesn't work for us, working closely with the other community is going to help us make a better CentOS. And I noticed Celeste said CentOS and I say CentOS. So that's interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, this is a sister community. We should be working very closely with them to make sure that everything is smooth from their process to our process and back and forth. Um, we are separate, but at the same time, we are the same family. And we should take advantage of that. There is also a significant overlap in people that contribute to Fedora and people that potentially contribute or want to contribute to CentOS. Uh, so while I think there will always be some amount of separation, I think we also need to try and do a good job to cater at folks that want to straggle both ecosystems and make sure that, say, processes are unified in a way that it doesn't feel too different working within the CentOS ecosystem versus Fedora and vice versa and things like that. Yeah, on the uh, contribution front, my uh, deep and abiding hope is we have a lot of folks who test some stuff out on Fedora. Oh, yeah, I can fix that. They send a patch to Fedora, and that's wonderful, and please keep doing that. And then that patch gets queued up for rel n plus one. And if we can build this kind of a workflow where Oh, they send it to, to Fedora. Oh, would you like to also send it to CentOS Stream for some testing there? Would you like to also build some unit tests or some workflow environments where we can get these things not just out into more hands, but also regression tested, also unit tested, also build uh, out, also get some documentation in place about these new features so that it becomes this kind of traditional workflow where, oh, I have this thing that I want to do. You throw it up to the wall and some workflow just appears that makes it accessible, readily available, documented, tested, and available for anyone who needs it. And that's in place in bits of Fedora, but without that workflow back into streams so that it then feeds back into RHEL, they are separate workflows. And I'd love to see them as one kind of master plan for make good open source software. Well, I think it's a matter of how fast do you want it to want it to get into RHEL. If you get it into Fedora, it's it's eventually going to get into RHEL, more or less. But uh, um, but if you want it in less than several years, then uh, then yeah, you definitely have to engage with us. Yeah, not a lot of these things, I think, also setting expectations is very important because what I think really sucks as a contributor experience is if you put up an MR or you file a bug and then nothing happens for six months and then it's magically merged. That's a pretty crappy experience. Or if you put up a bug and you see a million comments that are all in the private side of the bug. So you just see CC a random person at Reddit for three months and then it's closed without comments. That's a bad experience for people. So I think making those better and adding things where like, oh, you put up a bug, you put up an MR, here's what you can expect to happen. There's these rounds of QA needs to go through, there's these people that need to sign off on it and all that. And I think if people know what they're signing up for, it, 
it makes it a lot easier and I think it reduces some of the frustration folks might have there. So it sounds like from the Fedora community perspective, we have some, I guess, either like training or education on what the stream ought to look like. So where is upstream? Does it start with Fedora? Does it start with CentOS? Like where, where does it go so that they know that they have the best chance of success for submitting their patch at the right place? Because if you have lifetime Fedora contributors, they might not know or care what the CentOS or like uh, RHEL workflow process is. That's like saying, you know, somebody who's three distributions separated from Debian is wondering why everybody isn't benefiting from their patch. Well, if you if you want all the distributions based off of Debian to benefit from the patch, you submit it to Debian. You don't submit it downstream and hope it floats up. And so as we're, you know, kind of merging these different streams of contribution, it might be, you know, for the older contributors, re-educating them on what the workflow actually is, but then also not discouraging them because nobody likes change. They want to do it the way that they've been doing it. And what is the easiest way that we can support them? Sean, are you back mic wise or you want to keep me to keep reading things? No. <laughs> no. Okay. So um, there is one from Rich about new SIGs, but I'll come back to that because there was something that someone put in that was kind of related to the conversation we're having. So from Anonymous, speaking of being able to contribute to stream, what can the community do to help release new kernels faster or at least to get some insight into the process? In particular, I'm thinking of a kernel with a fix for CVE-2022-0185, which was released for RHEL two weeks ago. I gotta look up which CVE that one is. <laughs> yeah, same, I just, I just Googled for it. <laughs> I think they just gave that as an example, but they're more interested in the process. Yeah. Uh, so I think the kernel is an interesting example here um, because in the past, the the kernel was a pretty difficult thing to contribute for in this ecosystem in that it was developed mostly behind closed doors and you would get code corrupts and stuff and you would get these massive tarballs. Uh, now it's developed on a GitLab tree that you can go there, you can send them ours, and there's a definite process for contribution there. Um, the RHEL kernel folks actually gave a talk that I believe it was the previous Dojo or the one before that about how to contribute to the RHEL kernel. Um, so that is that is definitely an avenue that people can take. This doesn't help with the release, of course. Um, my understanding for this, I don't know about this specific CV, but I did see some conversation on IRC about a security thing in the RHEL kernel, in the CentOS string kernel. And I think the conclusion was that it was pushed to a compose, but the compose wasn't marked as public or whatever, so it didn't get to the mirrors yet. And that was part of the reason for the delay. Um, that is probably something we can look at with Infra and see if we can make that process better or get a better understanding of, again, what the expectations should be there. Yeah, there's definite room for improvement on the workflow in terms of getting it clearly documented and well understood. Uh, I don't do a lot of interactions with the kernel team folks, so I don't know their process really. And so that does get us back around to the joys of clear documentation. And as Celeste was talking about, clear senses of onboarding and how to get from point A to point B. So for what is worth, I will put in the chat the way at least the Hyperscale SIG understands kernel contributions work, or at least the process we've been following and I've tried to document in case people find it useful. Yeah, and it sounds like we could even add some documentation that links you over to that GitLab repo you were talking about. So that if people know if they want to contribute to kernels, this is where they need to do it. Um, and then we can always work on a process to get things in and how it is. Um, all right, let's go back to that SIG one from Rich because I skipped over it. 
Are there any spaces in which you would like to see a new SIG in the coming year? RPM OS tree. Uh, that is fascinating uh, for it. I, I spend a lot of my time thinking about the science use case and RPM OS tree gives you perfect replication of perfectly reproducible systems. And the, the mantra in science is always, if it's not reproducible, it's not science. And so the idea of taking a actual running OS image and making it perfectly reproducible is deeply interesting to me. Uh, that being said, having the time to work on it is uh, complicated. In in the past, I'm, I'm sure there's probably one exception, at least one exception already. But um, we've we shied away from SIGs tied to a specific piece, a, a specific software, and focus them more on a category uh, the software fits into. So would we would we maybe do that here? Is there is there uh, a, a different way to frame this, SIG? Uh, it's the uh, effectively an offshoot of the uh, RHEL for Edge uh, feature set. And so the uh, reproducible systems or uh, checkpointed installations or perhaps immutable OS images. But reproducible, also... yeah, reproducible system sounds like a a really excellent concept to me. For, a SIG for, for reliability something. or a SIG for yeah. science, depending on how you want to scope the activities. Yeah, I think reproducible builds in general and reproducibility would be a very interesting thing to see because it's a subject that I think there's generally interest and there's already effort in, in the industry. Um, so I think that could be quite interesting. Um, also, yeah, I think for the, the OS3 thing specifically, we could easily make an immutable, say immutable images SIG or whatever, if somebody wanted to work on it. I feel like for a lot of these things, the limiting factor is people to actually do the work because <laughs> uh, it is a lot of work. All right, I'm going to skip one question and we'll go back to it because we have a follow-up related to the last CVE question. It's not just the kernel. CentOS stream is getting a reputation for delayed CVE fixes. People understand that Red Hat engineers will not put those fixes into, no, excuse me. People understand that Red Hat engineers will put those fixes into RHEL first for customers, but we're seeing Fedora get those fixes within a day or two of RHEL, but stream taking weeks. How does the board plan to shift Red Hat attitude, attitudes towards stream being just a development platform. And I'm not sure it's an attitude issue. I think it may be what we've already been discussing about a flow in a process. So if Fedora gets it within a couple days, you know, maybe we can get it a few days after Fedora. I mean, to me, that sounds more like a process than an attitude problem. Yeah, I think there's a few things here. Um, I, for, for the CD stuff in general, I, I actually tried to get this written up because I was also getting somewhat confused by the way this works. My understanding is that in general changes go into stream first and then they go into rail. The exception is that if there's a security thing that is embargoed and in that case, the development for the fix will happen behind closed doors because it's embargoed and then it would get released to our customers and then it would get to stream when the embargo is lifted. Um, that's like, in my understanding is that's the only scenario where if the process works right, you should have delayed fixes in stream. Uh, in this case, again, what I believe happened is that the fix was added to stream relatively quickly, but it didn't make it to a public compose on the mirrors until later because it took a while for the compose to trickle through the infra. Um, I definitely agree we need to do a better job here at communicating what the expectations are. Uh, there is no official guarantee around how CVs are handled for stream as there wasn't before for CentOS. So that's, um, but that doesn't mean that we should leave folks hanging. Uh, on the development platform thing, I think 
different folks have different feelings for what stream is and what they want to get out of it. Uh, I think it's certainly true that there are some people within Red Hat that see stream only as a development platform. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's all the stream is, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody working on stream feels the same thing. Um, I'd encourage folks to actually look at the product and decide whether it works for them and for their use cases and make a decision based on that. Yeah. And as I am going to sort of point at the uh, dual workflow of stream eight versus stream nine. Uh, the, the stream eight workflow was in many ways developed by developing it. Um, there was this great push to get stream in place. And part of that was, all right, let's try a thing and see how that thing works. And in many ways, stream nine is the lessons learned from this. And that, uh, that comes with some pain points on eight um, because the workflow on eight is kind of made up as it was built. It was kind of made up as it was built uh, with stream nine. It sits in the critical path on RHEL. Um, it sits as part of the RHEL development process, part of the RHEL development workflow. And so nine is going to be better than eight in basically every respect in terms of the stream workflow. That, that isn't to say that I'm happy with an eight second delay in CVE releases. Um, I'm gonna want them out the door, the, the CPU tick that they're available. That's just, part of my desire for good software. But uh, eight is got this kind of growing pain attached to it. That is an artifact of trying to find something that's going to work great and then figuring out what's going to work better. All right, I'm going to backtrack to a question we skipped so that we could do that closely in relationship to the kernel question. What opportunities do you see, if indeed at all, to work more closely with the various rebuilt projects? Is this a priority? So I, I come from the rebuild space, so it is a personal priority for me where I want our downstream rebuilders to have a good experience, to have a good environment. Uh, part, part of playing nicely in this ecosystem when I was on the rebuild side was trying to get my build fixes pushed back up the chain to make that easier for them to then trickle back down mostly so I didn't have to keep maintaining them. Uh, now that I sit up the chain, I want to make the rebuild experience painless. I, I want it to be trivial so that someone who decides that they would like to experiment with what Linux build systems look like can look at stream as a place to try and build an entire distribution as a proof of concept. Uh, right now, if you want to do a, well, let's see what it's like to build a distribution. A lot of folks go to Linux from scratch. That's a great project. You should play with it. But if you would like to try a different system, well, what if you tried rebuilding stream? It's a great product. You should play with it. And so to provide more places for people to experiment with what it means to build a distribution, is going to get us more mind share of what it means to innovate in these build environments and to get us the kind of new ideas about how to compose a distribution. So having a happy, solid, well-established relationship with our rebuild friends is deeply important to me, both historically and as a part of building up the next generation of computing people. Yeah, the rebuilds are part of our community. So I feel if, if there are things that don't work well for the rebuilds for what they're trying to do, we should strive to make things easier for them. And at the same time, I would welcome and I would love to see folks coming from rebuild from the rebuild projects get more involved into CentOS stream proper and working there uh, and like contributing to SIGs. And we are starting to see some of that actually, but I would love to see more of that. All right, we're gonna momentarily skip a question again to go back to CVE issue. Um, David, how do you feel about putting together a formal policy for CVE fix availability? Uh, so personally, I feel that would be great. Uh, in practice, 
I think the constraint for doing something like this is that someone has to do the work. Uh, and uh, right now, and this is especially tricky because most of the CV work happens within Red Hat. So this is something that would have to be figured out with how can we do this in a way that doesn't cause an undue burden for Red Hat and that can make everybody happy. But in, in principle, yes, I would love to have that. And I think even if we don't end up making a formal policy, I think having some clarity actually written up somewhere in this is exactly how this works. These are exactly what your expectations are would be useful. Um, I had started writing up a HackMD, uh, which I can't find right now, but when the Polkids thing happened, uh, that I love to develop into a thing we can actually public, uh, put publicly on the wiki. I have not published that because I don't know if it's right, so I didn't want to spread misinformation. All righty, let me go back to that other question we skipped. When will we see a public channel for RHEL folks to communicate to the community? Right now, there's no way to discover folks or talk to them to figure out what to do. My, my inkling would be that that is what the CentOS DVAL list is for. Um, we, we want our, our, our Red Hat developers are part of our community and our community is part of developing stream. And for as much as occasionally I talk about them as different people, they're really one team composed of a worldwide workforce of different employees with different employers. And I think part of our mind shift from CentOS to CentOS Stream is understanding that we work directly with the Red Hat developers now, rather than just consume their work and hope our patches trickle at them. And so that's gonna be a it's a culture shift, but I think it's a really important and really good one. Yeah, I agree. Um, whether it's on the develop mailing list or in IRC, I don't think it's important that someone is known to be from Red Hat. I think it's more important that they are part of the community and they feel like a part of the community and you talk to them just like you would anyone else in the community. I believe we have caught all the Q&A questions. Does anyone else have anything else they'd like to ask us? I'm kind of going through the channel chat right now and see if we if there was anything in there we should ask. Someone did suggest an immutable system SIG. Yeah. That sounds amazing to me. Um, I would love to see work on that. I would be happy to be your board sponsor. And I have like no hours per month to commit to that. Um, it's one of those complicated things. Uh, there's a follow-up by Anonymous in the Q&A tab uh, where they're saying run developers are not on CentOS Devel, nor they're present on CentOS RC channel, nor do they talk to anyone on Bugzilla. So this expectation that part of the community is slowed when they're not there. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think that's actually true in the general sense, in my experience. I've definitely talked to RL developers on all of these channels. Uh, but I mean, RL developers is a fairly amorphous group. Like it is a lot of people and I think different people might be better at this or worse at this. I, it's also a big change for a lot of these folks because a lot of these folks were used to working effectively behind closed doors and they were not used to interacting with like the wider world. So I think there is still an adjustment period that you've been seeing, especially during eight where people get used to the process and you'll see it sometimes where you file a bug and it you get a comment on it that doesn't make quite a lot of sense. And then you follow up and it's like, oh, okay, this is how this works now. And then the right thing happens. And my hope is that we will start shifting more and more towards the right thing happening here. Um, with that said, if there's specific people, projects, things that you're seeing that you're having trouble communicating with, um, I think everybody here is happy to try an open line of communications if we can. You're also welcome to come in IRC or to ask on the list. 
and bring up if there are specific areas that you're having trouble contributing to. Uh, I, I think everybody here wants the right thing to happen and wants everybody to be involved. Uh, and when that process breaks down, we want to fix it. Yeah. And I think it's important to note on the mailing list, people may be using their private home email addresses versus their work email addresses. I do that a lot in open source. So you may not realize you are talking to a real developer. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Yeah. And on the uh, name places you're having communication issues, uh, sometimes it's just that people aren't used to the new process. So it's, it's a, uh, let's talk about a thing, not a name and shame, um, because this is a different workflow and just as sort of a part of etiquette, people are less likely to help you when you're mean to them. Um, so if you're having some communication breakdowns, uh, let's, let's try and find a way to make it better, not point out where it's broken. As we, we all know that there are parts of the process that are broken and we definitely want them to be not broken. But uh, when you're changing someone's daily workflows, that's they're used to working a certain way. Um, I, I will say that uh, the occasional updates on glibc that I see posted by Florian in the uh, Devo list, just like those warm my heart in ways I can't even express. Uh, the, the questions that I'm going to have months from now as I dig into how this works, the answers are just put there by the person doing the work. And so I will say that that is a, definitely a piece of our success story in getting these communication channels opened up. And I would love to see more things like that from uh, RHEL developers who are willing to put in the effort it takes to actually type up the summary of changes in a way for someone who does not hack that code daily, which is again, a labor challenge. Um, the, the discussion on transformative architecture stuff and art instruction inserts I barely understand that. And so the way in which he spent the time to type that up so that I could understand it was definitely an imposition on his time that he could have been hacking away at the code. And so when we think about getting more communication from them, we do have to remember that these are also people who are really passionate about open source and spending the time to write up a uh, naive documentation is time that they're not spending working on their passion of making great software. And so getting that balance achieved is something that's gonna happen on a person by person basis based on who they are and how comfortable they are spending that time doing the writing. I think you're still broken, Sean. Yeah. Poor Sean. Sean, do you want to type in the chat and we'll read it for you? Oh yeah, I think we're almost out of time. Yeah. This was what, 45 minutes? Yeah. You know, we've got about nine minutes left for uh, anybody who wants to get in before the buzzer. <laughs> um, looking through the Q&A, did we answer uh, Neil's question about what we hope to see in the next year of uh, CentOS stream? I kind of thought we did at the very, very beginning. Um, I think that's the question Sean was trying to read when he was breaking up. Um, but if anyone wants to expand on that. Yeah, and I will say that uh, my interest uh, is surprisingly focused on documentation right now. Uh, there's so much that's happening in so many different ways to get that expressed in a format that is digestible would be wonderful. But also for the folks who have not done technical writing, more work than you expect. Um, 
is uh, creating clarity on highly technical topics is difficult on good days. Yeah, that is also an area where I think, sorry, Amy. I'm just going to put this out there. If anyone does want to write documentation and wants someone to review it, um, just hit me up. I'm more than happy to review and make it readable and human accessible. Go ahead, David. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think this is an excellent area where people can get started contributing to the project, uh, even if they maybe they're not, they're not comfortable doing coding work or doing other kinds of technical work. I think documentation is extremely important and it is the kind of the kind of work that tends to be neglected. Uh, so if there are folks that are maybe CentOS users that would like to get more involved with the project, I think documentation is an excellent place to start. And it isn't just about writing processes down. The act of documenting demystifies the process and you get efficiencies that way because you cut out all the things that are cultural lore and you figure out exactly what the most efficient process is. And so in addition to writing down our tacit knowledge that only a small core group of people know, we can start to work on improving those processes as well. And I think that's going to be really critical is, you know, there's still confusions between the, you know, version eight or version nine, which way is the right way? How do we communicate between all of the different streams? What direction are things going? It's not just about writing it down, but the act of writing it down will help clarify a lot of those processes for people. And I think that's that's really what we gain from the documentation. And also very important on the operator user side, if you're running through the documentation, if you have a question, if you find an issue, those are great first patches, ways to get into the community where you're not looking, necessarily doing the code, but you're actually the one using it and reading it and going through documentation and realizing it doesn't work as we think it does. So yeah. really great place to get started. Yeah, that feedback is so critical. Um, we, we know the documentation is incomplete. We don't know where the documentation is incomplete. And that, that distinction is something that someone who has no technical writing background has been using Linux for five minutes can go, oh, uh, you, you need to explain what this means here. And even filing that bug will help us. Are we out of time? Do we have more time? Um, Sean mentioned, by the way, there is a CentOS Docs mailing list that you all should look at um, if you're interested in working on documentation. Sean asked me to do a wrap up here since he has robot voice syndrome today. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you all for your great questions and for these answers. Um, two comments about this. One is that this video will be posted to YouTube so people can, can see the questions and answers more publicly. But the other more important thing is if you have more questions, come to the mailing list. Ask these questions on the mailing list so that they can have a much larger audience and community discussion of these points. Um, thank you for our directors who were able to join us. Um, we have a couple more directors that are in the chat, and you can continue this discussion with them both in the hallway track and in the event chat over the course of the next two days. So once again, thank you, and uh, please do come join us in the hallway track. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thanks, all.